Mercedes has recently appeared to be targeting younger drivers. There's the latest A-Class and the all-new CLA, with some serious engine power appeal. And this is also the first time ever that Mercedes-Benz's performance division, AMG, has ventured into the compact class. On the outside, at least, the CLA looks like a sedan version of the A-Class. Its maker classes it as a coupe. Our car tester Sasha is trying out the most powerful four-cylinder engine in series production anywhere, found under the hood of the CLA 45 AMG. It boasts a maximum output of 265 kilowatts and 450 newton meters of torque. Sounds promising, as the engine is eager to confirm. That's some power coming out of the modest two-liter displacement. Sasha notes that common elements with the SLS AMG, the air inlets, and the gear knob. The speedometer goes up to 320 kilometers per hour, but the top speed is electronically limited to 250. If you're prepared to invest an extra couple thousand euros, then you're up to 270 kilometers per hour. The CLA AMG makes the sprint to 100 kilometers per hour in a dashing 4.6 seconds. Fuel consumption is officially just 6.9 liters of premium unleaded for 100 kilometers. Although to actually achieve that level of efficiency, you'd have to drive way under the car's performance potential. The AMG version is a driver's car, says chief designer Volker Helwig. His team wanted the elements that the driver needs to be functional and nice looking. The instrument cluster had to be easy to read. The steering wheel had to be pleasant to hold and also afford a good view of the road. Plus, it has paddles for direct shifting. And the performance seats provide solid support for active driving in terms of lateral acceleration and side support. You have the whole car nicely under control. The CLA AMG is a high-performance vehicle. It's fitted with AMG 7-gear SpeedShift DCT sports transmission with three driving programs. In manual and sports modes, the shift times rival those of the SLS AMG Grand Tour. Experienced racing drivers have the option of switching off the ESP and the ESP Curve Dynamic Assist. The sports suspension has larger stabilizers and reduces roll when navigating fast double bends. So what about the ride for rear seat passengers? Sasha says it feels as uncomfortable as it looks. The driver and front passenger are kept in place by these firm sports seats. At the back, you're kept in place by the roof and the seat in front. There's precious little leg room or headroom. Not that surprising, actually, given the coupe's plunging roofline. Design was evidently given priority over comfort here. Mercedes wanted the CLA to be part of the AMG brand, reveals Volker Helwig. That meant making the brand design clearly visible. There's the twin blade radiator grille, the mark of an authentic AMG. Then his design team worked on the technical functions, the cooling and aerodynamics. The front splitter down below generates downforce. There are the wheel arch air vents. The front splitter is continued visually via the rocker panels to the rear. All these features make the vehicle a recognizable AMG. The rear with its flowing contours bears strong parallels to the car's much bigger brother, the CLS. The CLA AMG is standard fitted with variable all-wheel drive. In regular driving conditions, it prefers the front axle, which translates into greater efficiency. If you need more power, the system can distribute 50% of the power to the rear wheels. Sasha finds the suspension unsuitable for potholed roads, but when you're negotiating fast curves, the car grips the pavement well. He's impressed. The CLA AMG, then, is a car for speed, not a comfortable ride. 
And there's another drawback. Putting a Mercedes CLA 45 AMG through its paces doesn't come cheap, notes Sasha. It costs around 56,000 euros. The regular CLA 29,000. The question is whether you really need 265 kilowatts of power, or whether you're content with a more modest appearance and output. Ultimately, the financial aspect might be decisive. The CLA 45 AMG is for people who really enjoy driving and who have a sizable amount of cash at their disposal. It's one of the most instantly recognizable cars on the planet. And the new Porsche 911 Turbo S is due to hit the road at the end of the year. Its makers have somehow managed to further enhance the souped-up speedster. Porsche has moved from the active to adaptive aerodynamics, explains Thomas Wiegand. Instead of the straightforward rear wing still seen in the 997 Turbo, there's a rear wing and a retractable rear spoiler. The changes were always necessary because of the 911's less than ideal aerodynamics. The body's teardrop shape resembles that of an airplane wing. Differing air flows on the upper and lower sides result in the upforce that lifts planes off the ground. To prevent this happening with the 911, Porsche added parts to keep the car fast, but firmly on the road. The car maker continues to use rigid systems with some models. The retractable rear wing that has graced the 911 Turbo for so many years has now been revamped. It now moves in two stages, and its angle changes according to whether the sunroof is open or not. Opening the sunroof completely changes the car's aerodynamics, explains Bad Hamann. The wing can be adjusted to keep the vehicle balanced. Among the all-new features is the pneumatically extendable three-stage front spoiler. It generates additional downforce on the front axle. Stefan Hertzl reveals that the first time, with the 991 Turbo, Porsche used a mobile spoiler that can move to different positions. In the start position, it has a much higher approach angle compared to the preceding model, which makes it easier to enter parking garages. In the performance setting, the downforce can rival that seen in motorsports. The front edge is far lower down and it's extended forward a little to reach maximum downforce. The intermediate speed setting, which is engaged automatically at 120 kilometers per hour, is set for optimum efficiency, which means downforce values and drag coefficients similar to those in our preceding model, the 997 Turbo. But when combining adjustable spoiler and wing, it's crucial that they are correctly coordinated. Otherwise, the aerodynamics could, in fact, worsen. We realigned a car to test this so that we could steer the rear wing with the front spoiler extended. Coming up on the left, the standard configuration, and on the right, the test setup. The misalignment causes chaos on the rear axle, and the car drifts out. So, assuming the setup is correct, the faster you drive, the greater the downforce will be. In other words, speed means safety. Of course not, says Thomas Wiegand. The aerodynamic forces are proportional to the speed squared, and the steering response is far more sensitive. These effects compensate each other. A steering movement at a higher speed will be compensated by the higher aerodynamic forces, so you're equally safe, whatever the speed. Volkswagen proudly presents the Polo RWRC, based on the version that competes in the World Rally Championships. It delivers 162 kilowatts of power and 350 newton meters of torque, and has a top speed of 243 kilometers an hour. But those wanting to buy a special edition Polo RWRC need to hurry. Production is limited to just two and a half thousand. 
BMW will present the production version of the i8, its vision of the future motoring, at the Frankfurt Motor Show in September. The plug-in hybrid will boast a 96-kilowatt electric motor and a 169-kilowatt three-cylinder turbocharged gasoline engine. BMW says it consumes just 2.5 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers driven. The i8 is expected to sell for around 125,000 euros in Germany. Toyota unveiled the new generation of its hybrid Aris in January of this year. Now the compact is being joined by a new station wagon, the Aris Touring Sports. We tested the hybrid version of the Aris with the mid-range equipment features known as Life. Fog lights, a height adjustable passenger seat, and the multimedia sound system Toyota Touch are just some of the standard features. With that wealth of extras, Toyota hopes to convince customers who are still skeptical about the hybrid Aris. Test driver Matis Kurat says that especially in Europe, there's still some slight growth in the market for compact cars and station wagons. So it makes sense that Toyota is trying to fill that niche with the Aris Touring Sports, hoping to steal some customers away from the competition. Even genau in diese Nische auch noch rein möchte, um da noch ein paar Kunden den Wettbewerbern wegzuschnappen. The station wagon aims to be lighter and more dynamic than its rivals. The hybrid powertrain has three modes to increase fuel efficiency. Matis shows us the three buttons on the dashboard, electric vehicle or EV mode, eco and power mode. In EV mode, the car can drive up to two kilometers on the batteries alone at a speed of around 50 kilometers an hour. That's perfect for a short jaunt around the city, but when the gas-powered engine kicks in, consumption turns out to be higher than the official data. Montes says manufacturers' consumption figures are rarely accurate. Toyota says the Aris Touring Sports uses 3.7 liters as a hybrid. The reality is closer to five, five and a half. But that's still good for a gasoline engine. The price of the new Aris is also compelling. The hybrid station wagon we tested cost 24,400 euros. Weight, the chassis, space utilization, and the powertrain, all were central considerations in designing the Aurus Touring Sports. Engineers and designers worked in close collaboration. The fruit of their labors was built in Toyota's Bernaston plant in England. Mata says Europe is a big market for station wagons, so it's not surprising that Toyota developed the Aurus Touring Sports in Europe and built it in Britain. The blue backing on the Toyota logo symbolizes the car's hybrid status. And the large red cable shows how that hybrid technology is integrated. The design of the headlights and fog lights is new. The large tail lights dominate the car's rear. Back to the test drive. Toyota engineers have installed a CVT, or continuously variable transmission. Matas doesn't particularly like the CVT transmission. He says when you hit the accelerator, the engine revs higher, but there's no relative change in speed. But he admits it could just take some getting used to. Energy storage usually takes up lots of room in a hybrid. And what about our test vehicle? 
Toyota's Marcos Bergma says there are no space reductions, which is important in a station wagon. They need room and flexibility, and that goes for hybrids as well. There can't be any compromises, so the battery is placed out of the way behind the rear seats. Without the rear seats folded down, there's enough storage space to fit two large suitcases in the back. The cockpit is well organized and attractive in black and silver. But it's one thing to look good. How does it feel? Im Interieur haben sich die Mata says the designers really went to a lot of trouble with the interior. Everything fits together and the materials feel great. The dashboard even comes with leather trimming in this Auras Touring Sports. There's a good overview and everything is easy to reach. But he says the Japanese car maker doesn't do buttons well. On the steering wheel, they're too big and clunky. Toyota's Aura's Hybrid Touring Sports. It's a long name for a car, but the hybrid could make an impact with its fuel economy and low starting price. The BMW Motorrad Days is the biggest BMW motorcycle festival in the world. For three days, the two-wheelers take center stage in the southern German town of Garmisch-Partenkirchen. It's the 13th time the event has been staged, and it's grown in popularity far beyond Germany's borders. This year, 40,000 visitors from 40 countries came to pay tribute to Beamer bikes. It was a laid-back, friendly, and very informal atmosphere. Among the many bikes on show were these handcrafted one-offs from the Berlin firm Urban Motor. Their classic BMWs are transformed into the client's custom-built dream machines. It's all about passion, according to Urban Motors' Peter Dannenberg, for mechanics, old motorcycles, and old boxer engines. So they have the idea of making unique models. BMW's building block principle means they can turn them into anything. The firm mainly works with bikes from the 1970s and 80s. There are many similarities. The engines and frames are the same, so they can be changed in any way thinkable. It could be a flat tracker, a cafe racer, or a crossover model, a roadster, whatever the customer wants. The bikes don't just look great, they also pack some real power. A BMD Classic Boxer Sprint was put through its paces in an eight-mile drag race. This is the fun part for Peter Dannenberg. It's all about going head to head and putting on a show. He says, it's not about winning, it's about letting your bikes roar and leaving some rubber on the road. That's what it's about. The Urban Motor team are certainly enjoying the knockout competition. A huge adrenaline rush. You open the throttle and people love it. This year also marks a special anniversary. The first BMW motorcycle hit the market 90 years ago. Some of the Marquis milestone machines were out on display here, like this R23 from the very first production series. Only around 3,000 were built. Or this R69S. With a top speed of 175 kilometers an hour, it was the fastest German motorbike back in 1967. The F650 went into production in 1993. It was BMW's most successful motorbike well into the 2000s.
And there are no shortage of future BMW fans in Germany. The Motorrad days give junior bikers a chance to put their motocross skills on show. The Aston Martin DB5 needs no introduction. It is arguably the dream car of the 1960s and the most famous Bonmobile. As fans will know, the legendary sports car came to 007's aid once again in his latest on-screen adventure, Skyfall. Aston Martin specialist Beat Rose has a license to repair these cars. His company, Rose Engineering and Switzerland, services, repairs and restores all of the British car makers' models. Aston Martin and Bond go together like vodka and martini. Rose himself is now a man with a very special mission to restore the original DB5 used in the film Goldfinger. It's the world's most famous car, he says. So his team were surprised to be given the honor of restoring this legend. He speculates about the next James Bond, saying, I want this car. On behalf of a client, Ross acquired the car for around 2 million euros and is completely rebuilding it. It's a tough assignment because this is no ordinary DB5. It's equipped with all of the gadgets Q invented for Bond. The radar device that helps him track down the bad guys. Machine guns fitted into the bumpers. And a smoke machine in the trunk that really works. Rose explains how the film crew burned a gas-soaked rag or something like that in here. Then they injected more oil and compressed air. And the mixture of the two created the smoke, what we now call oil smoke. You can still see traces of the carbon deposits. He doubts this would meet modern CO2 emission standards. Other James Bond gadgets, like the retractable tire slasher, were largely the result of special effects trickery. In the movie, Q just screwed this part on, and presto, it was finished. The DB5 came out in 1963 and was produced until 1965. The DB stands for David Brown, Aston Martin's longtime owner. Today, a restored model costs around 300,000 euros, with super spy equipment not included. The 4-liter straight six-cylinder engine generates 210 kilowatts of power and propels the GT to a top speed of 240 kilometers an hour. Milan-based Carrozzeria Touring created the DB5's iconic design. The aluminum body covers a very thin tube frame that isn't terribly stable. Q's range of weighty gadgets put additional strain on the Goldfinger DB5 in places, the body has weakened and cracked. The film car was built in record time. In terms of weight, things were installed that weren't so great for the chassis. To make the vehicle safe and roadworthy, Rose says, it needs to be strengthened and modified. Beat Wos and his team still have some work to do to get the Goldfinger DB5 ready for action again. Until then, its new owner can sit back and enjoy a few martinis, naturally shaken, not stirred. <laughs>